and welcome to Contemporary Philosophy. My name is Mark Thoresby. In this video, we're going to be discussing Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations. It's considered his probably sort of magnum opus of work, um, and so he's a very, very important philosopher for the 20th century, um, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, in fact, you'll see here that I've, I've constructed the presentation here with the background of the city of Paris. We're going to see one of the more provocative ideas that Wittgenstein offers, is that philosophy, or it's not philosophy, but that language should be understood as a city, um, an ancient city that has a lot of different boroughs and streets. So we're going to see that Wittgenstein in the Philosophical Investigations really argues for a very different conception regarding language and its meaning. Um, in fact, this is the first of, the, of a couple of videos we're going to be doing on the Wittgenstein's investigations. Um, and, we're, and there's more I'll say here, so I guess we'll just sort of jump right into it. Um, so let's just start off here. Here's a picture of Wittgenstein, I think a year or two before his death. He, he was born in 1889 in Vienna, and he died in Cambridge, um, Great Britain, uh, in 1951. Um, a couple I just put sort of put down here. There's a great, great biography about Wittgenstein called The Duty of Genius by Ray Monk. If you're interested in Wittgenstein and you're interested in learning more about his life, uh, take a look at that text. It's a really good read. Um, and it's also, it's very interesting, provocative discussions about Wittgenstein and sort of what may have motivated him in his philosophy. Without doubt, this philosopher is one of the most influential philosophers of the entire 20th century. Uh, and certainly, we're going to see, we've looked previously at Frege's discussion of language. We've also taken a look at um, Husserl's discussion of logic. And we're going to see here is sort of building from Frege, but a very different perspective of language than Frege. Um, in fact, Wittgenstein was born in 1889. He actually was born in the wealthiest family, or one of the wealthiest families in Austria. So he was born in a very, very um, well-to-do family. Um, they were, his family and his grandfather was one of the head industrialists of, the, of, of all Europe. So he was literally born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Um, and he, in, but in 1904, his brother committed suicide. And in fact, many, a number of other people in his, in his family would commit suicide, including his other brother. Um, and so there's a sort of sad streak of Wittgenstein's life, his biography. Um, so many of his family sort of had, to, had the, the burden, the suffering of having suicide in their family. And Wittgenstein himself was suicidal. Ray Monk, in his biography, really focuses on this and thinks this is a sort of key way in which we can understand um, uh, Wittgenstein. Now, in 1906, uh, Wittgenstein began studying mechanical engineering in Berlin, uh, where he got interested in studying aeronautical engineering. And uh, keep in mind, this is before flight had been invented. Uh, and so he became very much interested in part of the race, international race, to develop the first airplane. Uh, and actually, in 1910, he filed a patent for a propeller, um, which eventually, I believe by the 50s, would be implemented in helicopters. Uh, so it's quite interesting. Um, when he was working on his patent for a for propeller, he had to do a lot of mathematics. He began thinking about some of the problems regarding mathematics. He even started working on his own treatise in philosophy and mathematics, and he started corresponding with Frege and also with Bertrand Russell. In 1908, he actually moved to England and went to Manchester University. Uh, sorry, there's, there's a lot of spelling errors in it today because for some reason or another, when I was building the presentation, I couldn't get the computer to realize I was writing in English. I thought I was writing in German the whole time. So I didn't catch the spelling error. So my apologies. Uh, but he, went to, he goes to Manchester University. And during his years at Manchester, he begins communicating with Bertrand Russell. And by 1912, he actually transfers to Trinity College and studies under Bertrand Russell. Within a year, Bertrand Russell conceived of Wittgenstein and his protege. And even proclaimed that he had nothing left to teach Wittgenstein regarding mathematics or regarding logic. Um, in 1913, um, Wittgenstein decides to give up. He begins actually sort of working on his primary, one of his first early primary work in philosophy, which is known as the Tractatus. Uh, but he didn't feel like he was getting, uh, he was, the Cambridge was a good atmosphere for that, ironically. Um, and so he actually left and moved to Norway, built his own house, and lived in the middle of the woods and began writing his book, the Tractatus. And the goal of the Tractatus was really to solve philosophical problems by laying bare the formal logical structure of language. And Wittgenstein's view is that 
if we can come to an understanding regarding the structure of language in the Tractatus, then what we can do is we can then begin to understand what sorts of problems are genuine problems of philosophy and which ones are just merely problems that are created through complications of language. Um, and, he's, and of course, this is all has a, a very detailed and specific relationship to the work of Frege in particular, and also the work of Russell. Um, now, in 1914, Wittgenstein joins, he enlists to join the World War I. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'll have to edit that out. <coughs> oh, pardon me. In 1914, he, he joins and enlists in the war. Um, and in fact, Wittgenstein spent most of World War I writing the rest of the Tractatus. And in fact, he was eventually pulled, he was eventually captured. He was fighting on the side of Austria and put in an Italian, to put in a prisoner of war camp in Italy, I believe. And then he actually remained in a prisoner of war camp until the end of the war. While he was in the prisoner of war camp, he finishes the Tractatus, sends it to Russell, and it actually gets published. Um, and Russell writes an introduction, which was a sort of requirement for the publisher. Um, after the war ends, um, in 1918, after Wittgenstein's released, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus is published. Uh, he essentially thinks that he's solved all the problems in philosophy with this book, so time to move on. He becomes a school teacher. Uh, while he's a school teacher, he's not a very good school teacher, unfortunately. And in fact, he was known for boxing or hitting his students, uh, and this doesn't work out well, and he's, of course, to quit being a teacher. Uh, he also spends some time doing architectural work. Um, none of it really works well, but in the meantime, this book, the Tractatus, begins to really take on a lot of um, a lot of interesting minds get really interested, and they start teaching it actually at Cambridge. And there's a gentleman by the name of Frank Ramsey, who was a logician at Cambridge, studying logic in Cambridge, and he becomes very, very interested in the Tractatus, um, and he begins to communicate with Wittgenstein particularly regarding some of the discussions he has about logical atomism. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And eventually, uh, Ramsey asks enough questions that Wittgenstein realizes that there's, fundamental, there's a fundamental flaw within the Tractatus. And it's at that time that he decides eventually to return to philosophy. In 1929, he actually returns to Trinity College, um, at which time he, was, he would event, he, they used the Tractatus in order for him to confer upon him his degrees, and eventually, he, he takes on a position teaching philosophy at Cambridge University. Um, in 1940s, after he has a sort of long career, well, a longish career at Cambridge, um, and in but in 1947, he resigns from Trinity College because he felt that the academic environment was just not sufficient um, in order to do philosophy, and he wasn't able to think. But I'm skipping over a lot of interesting things that take place during these years. In 1949, Tragically, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and only two years later, he died in Cambridge. Um, so, and his last words were, tell them I've had a wonderful life, So, uh, which is good to hear. Now, I should say that Wittgenstein, there's a lot I could talk about in terms of biography, but in order to keep this video succinct, I'll, be, I'll just sort of skip, and skip, all, skip ahead, and I won't talk too much about his, um, his biography, but... It's quite interesting, and he was, he was a very, um, he was a brilliant intellectual, but definitely uh, was not a normal intellectual. He wasn't interested in being a university professor so much. In fact, in many ways, you might say that he's an odd philosopher because he sort of spends his entire philosophical career trying to get rid of philosophy. Now, one thing I did mention here is that is the publication of the Philosophical Investigations, which is the book that we'll be talking about today. Wittgenstein actually spent um, a long time writing this book and then organizing it, but he wasn't never fully satisfied with the way in which he was trying to organize its layout and structure. You'll see that when you read it, it's the, there's two parts of the investigations. The first part is a series of sectional remarks, um, and then the second part is a sort of more regular sort of section. There, it's not a regular book where there's a primary thesis that's laid out, and rather, there's really a sort of series of short remarks out of which the entire combination seems to reveal a particular way of viewing philosophy as well as a particular method in philosophy. It was published after his death, um, and um, it's been changing and shaping minds ever since. Uh, so let's sort of jump in here. Where some of the key works here I've already mentioned are the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, which is actually a very, very short book. 
and that's also composed of a series of propositions. But interestingly enough, those propositions are all organized according to a structural hierarchy. Um, there's also the Blue and the Brown books, which is a text I recommend for new readers of Wittgenstein. Um, it's actually, these are the textbooks he literally wrote for his own students. One was called the Blue Book because it had a blue cover, and another was called the Brown Book because it had a brown cover. Uh, but the Blue and the Brown books is a nice way to introduce you to some of the key ideas that get developed more thoroughly within the investigations. Now, we'll be focusing on the philosophical investigations, which is not an easy text. It ultimately frequently requires multiple readings, um, so I say read it slowly. A great little helpful book that I have, let's see if I've got here, is a book here that you may find interesting by Mary McKeon. It's called The Rulage Guidebook to Wittgenstein and the Philosophical Investigations. Um, I haven't, haven't really pulled too much from this book for this video, uh, but it is sort of a helpful secondary reader that will help explain some of the things that he talks about. There's also, and the, the final work he was writing on when he died was called on, was, was later translated and published by, I think Rush Reese was the translator. Um, I think, I might be wrong. Um, but it, that is a sort of response to a famous essay delivered by G. E. Moore. Um, so, but uncertainty is a very interesting text on epistemology and how we can have certainty about things. Uh, sort of the text he was writing when he died. There's also numerous other collections of Wittgenstein's work that have been published. Um, I believe there's one called Philosophical Grammar. Um, it's a pretty well-known one, and there's a couple others. But primarily, the key text for Wittgenstein is certainly the Tractatus and the Philosophical Investigations. He's also one of the few philosophers that um, really we, very rarely do we see a philosopher who sort of midway through their career sort of completely does an about-face and changes their perspective on language. And we're going to see that with Wittgenstein. So it's quite rare and quite interesting. Um, one of the things we will see, it's sort of in the background here, is the question of language, and we've been talking about this throughout all of the videos so far in this series. Um, on the one hand, with the philosophical, philosophical ideas and, our, and the sorts of philosophical problems that philosophers engage in, all are constituted within the medium of language. So, but what this means, though, is that what the structure of language is um, de facto a structural limitation for our philosophical problems as well. So part of what's at stake here is if we can get a better grasp on language and understand how language itself is meaningful, then maybe we'll be in a better position to assess the meaningfulness of these philosophical ideas that we encounter um, within philosophy or the, or the ones that we philosophically come up with ourselves. Now, so there's a couple of key ideas to come both within today's video as well as within some of the videos that are later to come on the investigations. One is we're going to see that Wittgenstein employs a method of description. So ultimately his, his methodology, if you will, is going to be to look to language and describe how it's used rather than to theorize how language operates and then to try to systematize that the those theoretical observations into some sort of overarching meta-theory or something. So Wittgenstein's view is, it's interesting because phenomenology, if we contrast this with Husserl, Husserl's view is we have to sort of look at how consciousness operates and describe it. But then Husserl goes on to sort of create this big theoretical structure around it. Wittgenstein takes a similar approach, except he doesn't look at consciousness. But he also isn't in the business of trying to create theoretical systems or systemic structures of philosophy. And instead, he simply seeks to describe how language is used and this seems to, in many ways, dissolve some of the problems that we think are at stake within language. So let's just call it the method of description for now. The second thing that is a key idea we're going to see in today's reading in particular is the notion of language games. Wittgenstein is going to argue that instead of thinking of language as some sort of hierarchical structure, the way in which maybe a computer program is created or something, instead, let's think of language as a series of games that we play. Those games are all different, and so the meaning of language depends upon the type of language game we're playing. And the type of language game depends upon the context we're living in and why we're speaking. So, for instance, just to give you an example, think of the word soul, right? Soul, right? Plato says we have souls, right? So, Plato uses the word soul in one way. Think about a priest might use the word soul in a religious format. Um, or think about the way in which um, a musician might be said to have soul in their music. Notice that the word soul in Plato is different from the, the, the usage of it is in music, and the usage of music is different than 
the usage of the word soul in church or by a priest. So think about the word soul seems to have different senses depending upon the context in which it's spoken. And here the idea is that what we can say is that the word soul has different meanings in, depending upon the type of language game that's at stake or that's in play. So we're going to talk about this today. It's going to be a primary key idea that's going to come out of today's discussion. Also, there's the notion of family resemblances. And there we're going to see that the meaningfulness of our words seems to bear resemblances in different languages, in different language games. But just because there's family resemblances doesn't mean that there has to be one essential meaning to something. Um, in here, for instance, if you're familiar with Plato and you're familiar with the Socratic dialogue, um, the Socratic mode of investigation in which, for instance, Socrates will try to figure out what justice means, and he'll do it by saying, well, justice in this context means this, justice in this context means this, justice in this other context means this. And what Socrates is always trying to do is sort of lace those together into one sort of pure essential definition. And we're going to see this is the exact opposite of Wittgenstein's view about how language works. For him, language has, there's resemblances to the way we use language, but that doesn't mean that there's one essential structure. And in fact, Wittgenstein suggests that we should resist that temptation to think of language as systemically structured in some sort of pure hierarchy. <clears throat> so you can, and by the way, this is what Wittgen, this is what Frege and is all about trying to do is to create to uncover the systemic structure of language and the same thing with Bertrand Russell. So what we see here is that in Wittgenstein we have a philosophical rejection of philosophy itself or we have a rejection of philosophical systemization. Instead Wittgenstein suggests a different view of philosophy which would maybe the notion that philosophy can be understood as therapy. That is the goal of philosophy shouldn't be to create some theory of the universe the goal of philosophy should be to help us understand where we misunderstand things. And so philosophy is a sort of therapy uh, to get us to see things the way they really are. Um, another key idea we'll talk about sort of probably at the end of the series is Wittgenstein's discussion of aspect blindness, um, which relates quite directly to his rejection of philosophical systemization and his notion of therapeutic philosophy. So there's a couple things we're going to get to at some point. <coughs> Excuse me. So to begin, uh, we're going to start off the very beginning of the philosophical investigations begins with a quotation in Latin from the great philosopher Saint Augustine. In, I believe it comes from his Confessions. It does Confessions section one, number eight, in which he quotes uh, he quotes Augustine's explanation for how he learned language. Augustine said in English, "Quote." When my elders named some object and accordingly moved towards something, I saw this, and I grasped that the thing was called by the sound that they uttered when they meant to point it out. Their intentions were shown by their bodily movements, as it were the natural language of all peoples, the expression of the face, the play of the eyes, the movement of other parts of the body, and the tone of the voice which expresses our state of mind in seeking, having, rejecting, or avoiding something. Thus, as I heard words repeatedly used in their proper places in various sentences, I gradually learned to understand what objects they signified, and after I had trained my mouth to form these signs, I used them to express my own desires." End quote. So, Wittgenstein begins here by essentially drawing a picture of a sort of very commonly held view regarding how language works and what language is all about. And this is a view that says, Language acquisition is developed by pointing, right? And so the idea is that if you're teaching someone language, you want to teach them what a tree is, you point at tree and say tree, they repeat it, and so on and so forth. And so there's this very, what we might call as a, a naive view of language that Gustin seems to set forth here. And this view of language might be called the naturalistic view of language, thinking of name, language as just a set of naming operations. Um, and that ultimately that's what language is, is a set of, of words, and the words are just signs or symbols for, for things, for objects in the world. And this is the view which, which would say that, okay, um, that language is seen as a, a set of ostensive definitions, right? Um, and ostensible here means to point at something, right? So here's a quotation from the very first section after Wittgenstein looks at this. 
He says the individual words in language name objects. Sentences are combinations of such names. And in this picture of language, we find the roots of the following idea, that every word has a meaning, and this meaning is correlated with the word. It's the object for which the word stands. So this is the sort of naturalistic view of language, and Wittgenstein describes this as really one possible view regarding what language is. We're going to see it's a view that he ultimately rejects. Okay, the next sort of thing that Wittgenstein looks to, he says, now let's think of a shopkeeper thought experiment. And he wants to do is think of a thought experiment that's similar to Augustine's, but different, right? He says, imagine you have five red apples, but you've never seen an apple before. And imagine that the way in which a person uses language is they're given a slip of paper that says five red apples. They, let's say they know what five is. They can count the cardinal numbers, right? And so you hand your little slip of paper to a shopkeeper. The shopkeeper looks up the word red and sees that there's a red color, okay? They look up the word apple and they say, okay, it's these things here. And so they go and they look and they find a red apple. And then they count one, two, three, four, five, right? And then they've gotten five red apples. So in this view of language, which is very close, the word red is, a, is correlated to an object, red, right, the color. And then the, the object, the word apple is correlated to the object apple, right? So now the question is, okay, this is that same view of language that Augustine holds. And let's see if this ultimately makes sense, right? Here's the quotation. He says, he, the shopkeeper, takes the slip uh, he or the person takes the slip to the shopkeeper who opens the drawer marked apples and he looks up the word red in the table, finds a color sample that's opposite to it. Then he says the series of cardinal numbers up to the word five for each number. He takes an apple of the same color as the sample out of the drawer. It is in this and similar ways that one operates with words, right? This is at least the Augustinian view, this naturalistic view of language. And notice here that Wittgenstein doesn't say this, but notice when we looked earlier at the sign reference distinction that we saw in Frege. Notice that for Frege, a word is treated as a sign that has a reference to an object, right? So notice here that Wittgenstein's giving these what almost look like silly thought experiments, but these thought experiments are precisely related to this sign reference distinction into this Fregean view of thinking of words in particular. And so Wittgenstein asks, well, what about the word five though? It seems like when I say five red apples in this case, the shopkeeper just memorized five. The word five doesn't really have any meaning except its use, right? It's just, it doesn't refer to this, that, or the other. It doesn't refer to an object. It seems to refer to a way of doing something, counting up to five, right? And this will be Wittgenstein's first introduction to the possibility that, uh, that maybe language, the meaningfulness of language, isn't given in terms of if there being a sign reference correlation, but rather in terms of there being a correlation with regard to the way in which we use our words. We're going to see this becomes a very important thing. Now, this means that it raises for us the philosophical conception of meaning. What does it mean to have meaning? And, um, and Wittgenstein here wants to suggest what he says is that a primitive view of how language functions would be this Augustinian perspective. Now, let's just imagine that that, let's just take that and run with it and ask ourselves, okay, if language is really just a set of correlational signs to objects, then let's imagine a language that really fits that definition in the most primitive sense. And this is where we get the, probably one of the most famous examples of the text, which is the builder's language. And Wittgenstein imagine there's a set of builders. There's two builders. Builder, the first builder is called A and the second builder is called B. And we can imagine that the way the builders work is one builder calls out a word and the other builder brings that object to the first builder, right? So he says, imagine these following words. You have block, pillar, slab, beam, right? A calls out slab, B brings the slab. A calls out a pillar, B brings the pillar, and so on and so forth. And Wittgenstein suggests we can imagine this, obviously not as a, a really as a, a language that's the same as what we do when we use language, but we might call this a complete primitive language modeled after this idea of the coordination between signs and references. So the question though is, <coughs> is this actually appropriate to call it a language? Well, Wittgenstein says yes, in a narrow context, 
it is a bit of an it is a language, um, but just in this really narrow context. Obviously, this isn't a language in the fuller sense, the way we use language when we tell jokes and communicate and write poetry. Those uses of language are not really captured by the builder's example, but if we take Augustinian's view seriously, then the builder's example is a complete um, language, is, is a language, um, you know, in this sort of minimal context. And here he said, he sort of gives the example, of think of games, and we get the first introduction to the notion of what a language game might be. Now he's going to come later and define language games in a very particular sense. By the way, I realize that this is misspelled. I mean, for all of you who want to comment on the misspellings, I apologize, uh, but bear with me here. I just do my best here. Uh, it's not always perfect, unfortunately. Um, so you've got language games. And so what he's only going to suggest is imagine, so in this case, there's a sort of language operates like a game where the words are like pieces that get moved in the game. So when builder A says slab, builder B does something, right? So there's a sort of correlation here between what the builders say and what they do. And so games is an interesting way to hypothetically compare, or there's a parallel to the way we play games to the, what this builder scenario looks like. And one of the things that's going to be interesting here is that we're going to see that there's no essence to what a game is. So for instance, th try to define what a game is under every condition. <coughs> Maybe you'll say a game is something where there's a competition between two players, or two or more players. Of course, I can give you the example of solitaire as a game. And then some people will say, well, every game is for fun. Well, and then I could say, well, what about, for instance, love games? Um, like when lovers play games with each other. Are those for fun? What does that mean exactly? Um, or think about war games. Those are certainly not for fun. And in fact, the more examples you can give of what a game is, um, I can always usually come up with an example of something that's not a game, something that we would call a game, but doesn't fit your definition. And this will actually be a very sort of important point because ultimately that's what Wittgenstein thinks here. Unlike the Tractatus where there's this sort of hierarchical structure of what language is, <coughs> Wittgenstein is moving here to, I guess, this pluralized, decentralized view of language, right? Now, if we return to Augustine's view of language, what we see there, whoops, is that language is treated like a script, like an algorithm. The shopkeeper has a sort of rule that they follow through. Now, think of the way computers do this, um, and this is sort of maybe that, that's the way in which we might understand it. Another way to think about this is think about the teaching of a language. The teaching of a language happens not by explaining the language, not by explanation, but by training, right? So if you want to teach someone how to use a language, you don't explain how the language works, you have to train them to use the words. And this is where we get to the notion of the ostensive teaching of words where you point to something, you say the word, and then a child repeats it. Wittgenstein suggests, quote, the children are brought up to perform these actions, to use these words as they do so, and to react in this way to the words of others. So uh, children are taught <coughs> the meaning of words, not by explaining what the sign and the reference are, but by pointing, using the words, and then if a child uses the words incorrectly, we correct them accordingly. Now, the purpose of this primitive language isn't to evoke images, to but to perform tasks. So if we stick to this notion here, of, um, if we stick to this notion of the builder's example, then they're, they're, we're not talking about trying to make people imagine things. We're talking about people merely just performing tasks and doing things. And this helps Wittgenstein introduce this concept of language games in section 7 of the investigations. He says, quote, we can also think of the whole process of using words in number two, in the shopkeeper example, as one of those games by, mean, by means of which children learn their native languages. I will call these language games. I will sometimes speak of a primitive language as a language game. And then a little bit later he says, I shall call the whole, consisting of language and the actions into which it is woven, a language game. So Wittgenstein is really sort of sticking here with the notion of language games as being really a critical model to help us understand how the meaningfulness of language works. And notice that in the game, in order for a game to have meaning, it has to be played. <coughs> and, um, and how it's played depends upon others. So we see sort of two things coming into play here, right? Is that language games require activities, they require a certain type of life that you live, certain types of things you have to do to play them. And also is that <coughs> 
A language also requires other people. So you have this notion that others are also involved. Um, sort of, so there's a social context to language. Now notice that a sort of pure platonic analysis of language that says there's these ideal forms and concepts and if you just get to them, we'll be in good shape. This seems to disregard the, the elements of language that this notion of language games seems to be bringing into the foreground. Wittgenstein gives the example of Ring Around a Rosie. Right, think of the way in which language is played there. I'm assuming um, you played this as a kid. You know, you go ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, uh, ashes, ashes, we all fall down, and there's a sort of game you play. And the words are a part of that game. And he wants to use this as a, a model for thinking about how language works. Now, let's ask this next question, or he asked this next question, is how might the builder's language expand? So what if we wanted to expand the language beyond simply pillar, slab, and block? Right? What do we do? Well, let's imagine that we combine the builders and the shopkeeper analogy. and Let's have color slabs and, and this sort of thing. And let's also introduce the notion of there and this. So imagine that the builders can say the slab goes there. You could write yellow slab, red pillar, so on and so forth. <coughs> so in this example, we have the similarity between the builder's example and the shopkeeper example where you have words which are being treated as having these ostensive definitions, words just reference objects, but, and there's also this sort of algorithmic view of the way language gets viewed. You can see what Wittgenstein's doing here is he's developing ultimately what we might say is a reductio ad absurdum argument, in which he, what he's saying is the more we think through this builder scenario, which fits the model of language that Augustine holds, the more we'll find it doesn't actually make sense, and it reduces down to an absurdity. That's ultimately the structure of this first section, is Wittgenstein really just wants to attack the Augustinian view of language, because he thinks that while Russell and Frege have very complex theories of language, and other philosophers have complex theories of language, he thinks that all of it ultimately boils down to this simplistic, not simplistic, but to this naive view of language that Augustine also holds. That doesn't mean that they got it from Augustine, but Augustine becomes sort of a signpost for this entire camp of philosophers who take this view of correspondence and sign and sig uh, signifier and reference and so forth. Now, let's imagine that in this expanded language, builder's language, they say red slab there, this red slab there, right? What does this and there mean? How can you teach that ostensibly, right? The problem is that <coughs> the pointing out of words occurs in the use of the words too, and not merely in the learning, and not merely in learning the use. Like, ask yourself when you point to something and say that, and you look so sit, you're sitting here right now watching this on a computer somewhere, pointing your computer screen and saying that. What makes the pointing do the work of telling you what that means, right? Notice that it's very difficult to answer that question. Right? What is it about pointing that means that there's a sort of invisible line that stretches from my finger out to the computer screen that I'm now looking at when I say that thing there? Why isn't it that my finger, we treat my finger as doing something else? Right? Uh, when I say that, maybe my finger could mean that is everything but what I'm, what, what I'm pointing at. Right? So why is it that pointing, how does pointing work in a language exactly? Notice that there and this you can't teach that by pointing to pointing, right? Because the pointing occurs in the use of the words itself, not simply in the physical thing, right? We can ask, what do these words signify here? It looks like what they signify is use and use alone. And notice that many different, there's many, many different uses of words. In fact, the uses of our words far outweigh the number of words we actually have, right? He says, quote, what confuses us is the uniform appearance of words when we hear them spoken or meet them in script and print. For their application is not presented to us clearly, especially when we're doing philosophy. And he gives the example of when you look under the hood, um, when you open up your hood and look at the engine underneath. He says you'll see all of these little levers and gadgets and things you know, plugged into each other, but all of it kind of looks the same to the untrained eye. You don't realize that one thing has a different use than another thing, there's so many different uses, it all kind of blends together. <coughs> you know, it looks like a, me a me mechanism of some sort. 
But he thinks this is what happens to us in language, is that language, the meaningfulness of language is ultimately derived in the use of our language, but that because there's so many different uses of words, we are tempted to try to simplify uh, the meaningfulness of language into some sort of simplistic structure. In other words, we try to make an engine out of the parts. Um, we try to come up with some sort of universal theory that explains all uses as being a similar or the same usage. Right? He says, quote, when we say every word in a language signifies something, we actually have said nothing whatever. Right? That actually is not meaningful. So when I say a language signifies something, it doesn't really tell you anything, anything really. Right? And Wittgenstein says here, imagine explaining the meaning of the word hammer with reference to how tools modify each other, right? Because one view would be say, okay, if a word doesn't signify something else, or, and I'm sorry, one way to approach Wittgenstein's problem here would be say, a word signifies something else, and so you have these other words like this, that, and whatever, and and, and or, and if then, and all these other words that don't really have ostensible definitions, so maybe what we can say is there's two types of words. There's words that have ostensive definitions, like the word pen. I can define it by pointing to this. And then there's other words which modify those words. And so maybe what you have here is you have a system where words modify other words, but all of it really is rooted down to these ostensible definitions where every word ultimately has a reference that it refers to. And so Wittgenstein says, well, that doesn't really make sense, though. Because if you try to explain the word, what the word hammer meant by explaining how a hammer can modify a nail, and then you explain how a nail can modify a wall, and you explain how a wall can modify a house, and, and you just articulate a structure of language or a theory of language which just points to the system of modification, at the end, you still don't really know what hammer means, right? Um, you've sort of been pulled around in circles here. So he doesn't think that just simply creating a more complex system of signification will do. It's not a sufficient way to deal with the problem. Another example, we can ask, are the color samples also part of the language then, right? So go back to the, the five apple example. Well, notice that if the language, the meaningfulness of a language is given in terms of the way in which we use the words, and we had color samples we were using, then doesn't that mean that those color samples count as words? And the answer is yes, right? <coughs> and that's why we have words like the. So he says, for instance, imagine if you said to someone, pronounce the word the, right? The, in that sense, does have a sort of ostensive definition. It has a meaning, but that meaning is given in terms of its use. And here's where Wittgenstein suggests really this alternate conception of what language is. And we, here he suggests we should think of language as a city. Now, here's an, it's part of this, there's an objection potentially, which is someone who might say, okay, this view that language is a set of games means that language is not complete. And, and Wittgenstein's response is, well, what language is complete? He says, quote, was language complete before the symboliz symbolization of chemistry and the notation of infinitesimal calculus were incorporated in it? For these are, so to speak, suburbs of our language. Our language may be seen as an ancient city, a maze of little streets and squares of old and new houses and additions from various periods, and this surrounded by a multitude of new boroughs with straight, regular streets. And so Wittgenstein's sort of view here is that Think of language as a city that's slowly evolving and changing, right? And the uses of our language correspond to different time periods in which there were sort of different ways we thought about things and different ways of doing things. Think of the word valor, for instance. How often do people today, at least in, in the United States, use the word valor? Answer, pretty much never. Or at least I never use the word. I never hear anyone use the word. But that word valor does have a use in the language, but that use is derived from an, an older, a more ancient time. It's still a part of our language, <coughs> but um, it's to know how to use it is to recall that sort of origin to some extent. So language is not complete, and what is language based upon? And here is a signal, a key concept we'll see language, see Wittgenstein really talk much more later on, is the notion of Lebensform, which is this German term for a life form or a form of life. And here's the key idea I want you to think of is to imagine a language 
always requires us to imagine a form of life. And so what Wittgenstein's view here is that it's not like there's some structure to language and that the goal of philosophy is to figure it out, what the ideal language is, and then, you know, stop talking in, the, in our ordinary ways. He says, no, language is based upon the types of, language is rooted in its use, and its use requires a certain context, a certain form of life. So the word valor has, recalls for us a certain form of life in which that would make sense. The use of that word would make sense. Um, think of the word soul, right? I gave that example earlier. If someone says you got soul, they don't mean that you have this spirit or ghost that's somehow infused in your brain or your body, right? They mean you have a certain sort of personality, a certain swagger to you, right? So notice that the word soul in that context refers to a different form of life than if I use the word soul in a church service and I said your soul is going to hell, Right? That means something very different. That refers to a different form of life, potentially. So our words are rooted into the contextual form of life out of which they're used. This is really critical. And you can see here that what Wittgenstein is doing is he's developing a strong critique against Frege here. In fact, he even talks about Frege throughout the book. And I'm not going to always go into what he says about Frege, but here's one quotation from section 22. Wittgenstein says, quote, Frege's idea that every assertion contains an assumption, which is the thing that is asserted, really rests on the possibility found in our language of writing every statement in the form, it is asserted that such and such is the case. But that is not a sentence in our language. That is, this kind of sentence, it is asserted that such and such, is not the type of sentence that would make sense within the builder's form of life. Which means that that sentence, it is asserted that such and such is the case, cannot be an essential view of for all language because it doesn't fit the most primitive form of language that we can imagine, right? So Frege, what he's doing here is he's beginning to deconstruct Frege's own assumption that language rests upon a sort of corresponding system where words have signs, words are signs which refer to other objects. And think here about Frege's discussion of function, object, and concept as well. Now, there's a sort of boxer footnote here at the footnote at the where section 22 is. I don't know what page that is um, in the text. Um, actually, it's on page 9 if you have the, the English text here by Anscombe. Um, in the boxer footnote, he gives this thing like says, Imagine you see a picture of a boxer, right? Um, and someone says, Boxer. How are you supposed to know what boxer refers to? Does boxer refer to this person? Is it a name of the person? Does a boxer refer to the type of athlete they are, which it does, because we, we know what a boxer is in English? Or does boxer refer to a certain style of training, to a certain way of holding one's arms? Does boxer refer to uh, the idea of not shaving your chest? I mean, what exactly does boxer refer to? You can ask yourself, what assumptions hold when you look at the photo and say boxer? What the assumptions are is that there's a certain form of life that corresponds to it, right? Um, so we can ask, well, how many words and sentences are possible in a language? <coughs> Pardon me, I must have something wrong with my throat here because it's hard for me to talk. How many sentences are possible if you have a language that's built and structured upon a theory of use rather than a theory of correspondence? And his answer, countless. Many, many, right? We can talk about giving orders, obeying orders. We can talk about describing an object's appearance, reporting an event, speculating about an event, forming and testing a hypothesis, play acting, singing, making a joke or telling one, translating the language, guessing at riddles, and so on and so forth. In fact, we can think of many, many, many types of language games that would change the way in which we understand the words which were being spoken, right? So, for instance, if I tell a joke about a moth, so here's a joke that I heard uh, recently. A moth goes into, this joke comes from a famous comedian from Santa Island, I forgot his name. But a moth goes into a dentist's office. And the moth asks the dentist, the moth sits down to the dentist, and the moth, be, moth begins to tell the dentist, right, that uh, the moth is very depressed, it's lost, it's, it's, its mother and father recently died, it's lost its job, it's depressed, it's not sure it knows what to do and so on and so forth. The dentist eventually replies to the moth, says, well, why are you here? It seems like you need to see a psychologist. And the moth says, well, I saw that the light was on, right? 
So that's a joke about moths. It's a silly joke, right? Uh, but notice that the word moth has a certain context because I'm telling a joke, right? The form of life in, or the context of the language game here is that of making a joke. And it's very different than maybe talking about moths in terms of scientific hypothesis testing, <laughs> right? Maybe I want to understand how moths fly, and so I do a test. But I'm talking about moths in the scientific sense have a different language game which means that my words have a sort of countless possibility. There's a whole spectrum of potential uses for language. So now what you should do is now compare the multiplicity of language when we describe it in this Wittgensteinian sense to the sorts of structural theories of language we find in other works of philosophy. In particular, Wittgenstein calls out his old work, the Tractatus, which sought to create an entire hierarchical structure that would be universal for all language. They involve picture theory of meaning and all this other sort of stuff. Um, so you can see here what Wittgenstein is essentially moving away from is an essentialist view of language towards a decentralized view of language, I guess. Now it's interesting, Wittgenstein does talk about animals. And he says, you know, most of the time we, and we notice that animals don't use language. And so that means we think they don't think. But really what it means is that they just don't use language. And what that means is that animals don't play the language games we do. And that makes sense because animals don't have the same form of life that we do. So that doesn't necessarily mean that animals don't think. It just means that they don't, that whatever it is they do do, if it's some sort of thinking, it's a type of thinking that we could never understand. Wittgenstein famously says later on in the Tractatus that even if a lion could speak, we wouldn't know what it meant, right? So imagine if a lion walked up to you and said, hello, right? you wouldn't really know what that meant because you wouldn't know what the form of life is for a lion. Maybe that's what a lion says right before they eat you, for instance. Um, it would be nonsensical because a form of life is always an embedded element that grounds or acts as the foundation for the meaningfulness of language because that's what contextualizes the use of language. So this brings us here to the question of naming. What does it mean to name something? And here, Wittgenstein says, think of naming as something like attaching a label to something, right? So uh, instead of a word, um, instead of saying that a name refers to the essence of something, think of it as something that's much more arbitrary than that, right? The process of naming doesn't have to clarify the meaning of a name, right? Imagine if I say water, or I say away, or I say ow, help, fine, or I say no, right? Those uses of words, do those name objects? No, they don't name objects. Uh, they seem to actually refer to a type of use, a type of context in which that would make sense. There's, right, so if I say the word no, that doesn't correspond to an object, but it does correspond to a potential context in which I can imagine someone making a denial of something. So what we see here is there is <coughs> is that um, naming is itself a type of language game, right? And naming cannot be just some type of ostensible definition, or ostensive definition. You know, for instance, imagine teaching the, the word number to someone. Um, whether the word number is necessary in an ostensive definition depends on whether without it, the other person takes the definition otherwise than I wish. And that will depend upon the circumstances under which it's given and on the person I give it to. And how he takes the definition is seen in the use that he makes of the word that's defined. So imagine if I'm trying to teach the word number to someone, the only way I can do it is by seeing if they use the word the same way I use the same word. Right? I don't, it's not that we can both point to the number two. So if I say, imagine if I'm trying to, um, I always think of there was a, a film that came out many years ago called, um, um, what was it, uh, Dances with Wolves. And it's a, it was a Kevin Costner film, sort of, uh, you know, um, 19th century love film about Native Americans and so on and so forth. And there's a spot where um, Kevin Costner plays a, a cowboy or a military, a Westerner, who's trying to learn the language and trying to teach English language to... Uh, native tribe that he's encountered in the West, on the frontier, if you will. And the way he does it, right, um, think, how would you teach the word number to someone who never heard that word before and spoke a different language? If you just pointed to the number two, 
how would the person know that you're pointing to to say that the, maybe they might think that number meant two? But that's not what you mean, because number three is also a number, or number four is a number. The only way in which you can eventually come to recognize that you mean the same things is if you use the words the same way. So what we see here is that the word number depends upon its use, right? And that use depends upon a certain form of life that would make sense. Imagine if you're explaining how to play chess to someone. So here's a rook in the game of chess. Well, how do you explain how, what the word rook means? Well, it's, you, have to, you wouldn't necessarily explain it simply by telling someone what the rules of chess are, because someone could learn the rules of chess without knowing that this piece was called a rook, or that piece was called a rook. Right? It's, be, it's through the use that it ultimately becomes clarified. So what this means ultimately is that Wittgenstein is developing a criticism against Wittgenstein's naive view of language, in terms of, well, let's call it the naturalistic view of language. And that's that ultimately Augustine begs the question. Or in other words, the account of language that Augustine argues for ultimately presupposes the use of language, which means if it presupposes the use of language, then it doesn't actually serve as an account of language, right? Um, quote, Augustine describes the learning of human language as if, um, uh, as if a child came into a strange country and did not understand the language of the country. That is, as if it had already had a language, only not this one. Or again, as if the child could already think, only not yet speak. And think here would mean something like talk to itself, right? Because Augustine sort of says, I learned language because someone would point to something and I would repeat what they said. And then someone would point to something else and I would repeat that. And I would eventually begin to articulate my own desires. There's as this view as if this child that Augustine was, in his mind, he already had language. And learning the language was just learning what he already had. But you can see that structure cannot serve as an explanation of language because it presupposes it. So this reveals a sort of philosophical lesson to us. And we can ask the question here, what does pointing really mean here? Wittgenstein says, quote, because we cannot specify any one bodily action, which we call pointing to the shape, we say that a spiritual or mental or intellectual activity corresponds to these words. Well, when our language suggests the body and there is none, there we should like to say is a spirit. <coughs> so we have Wittgenstein actually beginning to comment on a sort of mind-body dualism here, or this idea that there's a mind and there's a body and there's a body and a soul and this sort of business. And what Wittgenstein seems to suggest here is one of the things that philosophers will do is if we can't find the ostensive definition, then we just create a, a different framework to point to. That is, we say that, well, maybe um, that word actually has a mental um, object, or it's an intellectual object, or a spiritual object, like Husserl might say. And here Wittgenstein says, no, what you've done is you've taken a model ostensive model where every sign has to have a reference, has to have an object, and when you can't find an object, you just create one. You just invent one, whole, uh, whole clock. Right? This is moving beyond description into ultimately construction, if you will. So, what you see here is this. This is a philosophical problem for Wittgenstein. Because he thinks that this is the type of problem, this is the form of the problem that philosophers fall prey to. Um, and here you can think of when philosophers try to articulate a grand theory that everyone should agree, um, then Wittgenstein thinks that this is probably a good sign that your language has gone wrong and you have a false view of language. Uh, or he wants to show how philosophers fall prey to this false view of language. Now the word this might actually be the only genuine name there is. Because when I say this, the pointing right becomes demonstrative in that sense. And in a certain way, there's an interesting way in which this can only, right, because the word this only has its use in terms of the language game, the use of using it, uh, which means that this doesn't refer to an object, it refers to a use. In that sense, it's more genuine than the word apple, where I tend to think that the word apple refers to an object. Now, Wittgenstein's ultimate point is that the word apple also just refers to a different type of use within a, different, within a specific form of life. Imagine if I say, he's a bad apple, as opposed to saying, why don't you go buy me six apples, I'm hungry, right? The word apple there means two totally different things. Now, here's a very famous quote of Wittgenstein's from section 38. 
Wittgenstein says that philosophical problems arise when language goes on holiday. So as soon as we stop using language, this is when philosophical problems begin to develop. Because we, once we divorce the, our words from their uses, then that means that there is no, that number one is that philosophy no longer is talking about reality as it's given, but is now speculating about ideal forms of linguistic use. Um, so philosophical problems go on holiday. This is sort of the way in which we can see Wittgenstein's rejection of philosophical systems in favor of a therapeutic use of language, a therapeutic use of philosophy, I'm sorry. Now, what happens if a word has nothing to correspond to it whatsoever, right? Wittgenstein says, well, it's important to note that the word meaning is being used illicitly if it's used to signify the thing that corresponds to the word. So, meaning is not correspondence. Now consider what's known as the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth is a major artifact from modern philosophy, beginning really, though it goes further back, maybe to Augustine, but, um, or even further, but think about Descartes, right? Descartes' view is that if you say something, if I say that I'm holding a pen, that statement is only true if the state of affairs corresponds to it, right? So think here about meaning, if meaning is correspondence, then that's a false view. That's a false picture of language. If meaning isn't correspondence, it's use, um, right? It's a well, correspondence of use, maybe, you might say. So he says, imagine there's a proper name, and maybe the name is N, right? But now let's imagine that if we take this ostensive definition stuff seriously, then a, a name would have to correspond to an object. So let's imagine that something breaks down and we don't know how it corresponds. So if we did, so imagine there's two people who don't know this, and they don't know that the signs no longer have any correspondence, and then they start using the word "end" to talk about something, right? Maybe one builder says, "Bring me the end slab," and the other builder brings it and says, "Here is the this is the end slab," but the word "end," let's say, has lost its correspondence, and that maybe these builders aren't using it correctly. So you can ask yourself, well, if there's no correspondence, does "end" mean anything? Well, obviously, to say it has no meaning, what that really is is to say that there's no move within the language game, not to say that there's no corresponding thing, right? Because the, the meaningfulness is something like the move that's possible within a language. Think of Scrabble here, right? Um, so the word meaning can be defined thus. The meaning of a word is its use in language. This is very, very important. For, you, for those of you studying Wittgenstein here to grasp, is that meaning ultimately derive, it can be reduced down to the use of language, the way in which we actually use it, which means that the, the meaning of a word isn't given in a dictionary, it's given by the form of life of, out of which the words are themselves actually used and take place. So the word this um, is explained by means of pointing, right? It's a sort of interesting example of that. Okay, now here what we could do and what Wittgenstein does is he begins to contrast this new theory of language, this theory of language games, with some of the things we see in Plato as well as in Bertrand Russell or even in his earlier work, the Tractatus. <coughs> now if we look to the Theatetus in Plato, which is about naming and about language, what we see is that for Plato, um, the primary element, the primary unit of element for a language is a name. Which means that if you want to understand what a name is, you have to understand what its definition is. And Plato has a theory called the method of division, or has a method for this called the method of division, where you take a name and you divide up all of its context, and then you find the essential thread that links them all together, and then you break down each one of those sub-definitions further, and slowly you begin to define a whole system of things. So you can take a look at Plato. Plato's Socratic method effectively works in this way. Um, and this is, uh, this is the method of division. That's what logicians would call it. Now, this is sort of the classic approach to philosophy. And in fact, he thinks that Bertrand Russell does the same thing. He said the unit of analysis for Bertrand Russell is what he calls individuals. The unit of analysis for Wittgenstein and the Tractatus were objects, right? And for Plato, their names. But you can see here is that this unit of analysis all seems to presuppose this correspondence theory, right? Where the unit of analysis corresponds to something. 
And this is what Wittgenstein is ultimately going to reject, because what he's drawing our attention to is that there's a temptation in philosophy to construct a homogenous system for meaning, which is always the same um, and univocal across the entire spectrum. And this brings out the problem of logical atomism. Now, what is logical atomism? Well, logical atom is the view that language has a logical structure which rests upon irreducibly simple parts. <clears throat> In the same way that we say that the pen is made of atoms and the atoms are, you know, can't be divided, well, we know they can be, but in classic atomism, right, an atom means no cut or something that can't be divided. So a name for Plato functions as this simple unit of analysis, just like the objects function as a simple of ana unit of analysis for Wittgenstein's Tractatus. The problem with logical atomism, though, is what counts as being simple, because the word simple itself is dependent upon a an a priori language game which precedes it. That is, simple means different things in different contexts. Look here, Wittgenstein asks, what are the simple constituent parts of which reality is composed? What are the simple constituent parts of a chair? The bits of wood of which it's made? Or are they molecules? Are they atoms? Simple just means not composite. And here the point is, in what sense is composite have meaning? So it makes no sense at all to speak, to speak absolutely of, simple, of the simple parts of the chair. So in other words, atomism presupposes its own conceptual language game. So for instance, if I'm talking about the simple parts of a chair, but I'm talking with a carpenter, then I'm probably just talking about the bits of wood that make up the chair. If I'm talking about the parts of the simple parts of, of a chair, and but I'm talking to a chemist, then I'm probably talking about its molecular structure, right? Um, so you can see here is that the word simple itself refers to a specific type of language game. So that means that logical atomism um, basically is an example where, I guess, um, where it eats its own tail, right? Because ultimately it seems to beg, its own, beg the question here. Now Wittgenstein suggests, he says, okay, let's imagine a language game for the Theatetides one where there are these sort of simple names. And let's imagine here that we have simple words, like R refers to red, B refers to the color black, G to the color green, R to the color red, and W to the color white. Let's imagine that if you have this sentence, uh, this is a sort of sentence in this weird primitive language, and it actually refers to this sort of structure here, where you have nine boxes, and you have the different color variations. So you have R, R, B, G, 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 R, W, W. This is a sentence of primary elements. But now ask yourself, what does, does the figure contain four or nine elements? That is, is the element the, is the, element the color red? <coughs> or is the element red that's in this specific spot, right? Because notice that R1 is different from R2. So you can ask yourself here, even in something as simple as R, R, B, an, a language that just has R, B, G, and W in it, even in that case, um, the elements that it's based upon, there's a, there's a lack of clarity, right? Is the element the arrangement or is it the color? It's unclear. So even in the most simple, rudimentary things we might make, call a language, the problem of language games continually to persist. In other words, um, whatever unit of a language you choose, it depends upon a, uh, an a priori language game that it's drawn from. So there's an important question to ask here is, well, what is the criteria for a mistake in language? Right? When I make a mistake in language, that reveals that I made a mistake in terms of understanding the language game. Now, we're going to see later on in, the, in this series of videos on Wittgenstein that um, Wittgenstein ultimately is going to talk about the rules that govern a language game as being something like the logical grammar for the term of a word. Um, and we can say here is that when I make a mistake in language, the criteria I use is misuse, right? I don't, for instance, if I'm trying to teach you a language, I don't know that you have misunderstood the language until you use it in a way that's mistaken. So what's the criteria here? Again, it seems to be the use. Now, here this brings the question of rules, and we're going to see Wittgenstein has a long discussion about rules that we're going to get into and whether or not language 
is ultimately structured upon a sort of series of rules or not, what that would even mean. But we, there are some early suggestions here in this text, this early part of the text, where Wittgenstein says, well, what about rules? What sorts of rules govern these language terms? Well, here, realize that a rule could be lots of different things. There's no one way in which you can have a rule of language, because notice that a rule might be an aid in teaching the game. It might be an instrument of the game itself. It might be uh, something that's employed in that's employed in neither the teaching nor the game itself, um, nor it's set down in a list of rules, right? So, for instance, imagine if you're playing Scrabble and then you get upset and you flip the board upside down and all the pieces fall on the ground. Um, someone might say, "You're not allowed to do that. You just ended the game." You might reply by saying, "Well, it doesn't say in the list of rules you're not allowed to do that, right?" So notice there that just because even Scrabble, a board game, not all the rules are listed because playing the game evokes a specific context, right? A specific type of use. And if you're playing it, flipping the board wouldn't be a type of play. So that's why, so not every rule has to be written or even employed or treated as an instrument or even taught. So you can see here that rules, there's no one definition to what a rule is either which means that one learns a rule by recognizing the mistakes of others. And one recognizes that someone doesn't know the rules by recognizing the mistakes of others. Which means that rules seem to reveal some type of behavior. We have to be careful here. Wittgenstein is not arguing for some sort of behaviorist theory of language here. But he wants to point out here that what behavior reveals is an embedded type of use. And when people use it wrong, they act incorrectly. Um, and this is ultimately what seems to be at the basis here. Now, there's a sort of way in which I think Wittgenstein is also attacking a, a, ma a classic view of language here. And if you've taken the History of Philosophy series or you look at my video series here, you'll know that, that Plato had an I a transcendental theory for, for ideas, right? And he thought that ideas corresponded to these eternal forms that existed somewhere else that ultimately... Um, the philosopher would come to have knowledge of, and so on and so forth. And here we can see that Wittgenstein's view of language really attacks this platonic view of language. Quote, What the names in language signify must be indestructible, for it must be possible to describe the state of affairs in which everything destructible is destroyed. And this description will contain only words. <coughs> and what corresponds to these cannot then be destroyed, for otherwise the words would have no meaning. Right? And here Wittgenstein responds to this type of objection by saying, you can't saw off the branch upon which you're sitting, right? And this is a sort of anti-Platonic view here, right? And here I have a sort of picture that's taken um, from the internet of a person sawing the branch upon which they're sitting. And this ultimately is what he thinks that, that Platonic philosophy leads us to. Platonic philosophy wants to completely disregard the use of language in order to understand its transcendental uh, eternal structure. The problem is, there is no use for that. And so, what he thinks that Plato's view of reality ultimately is a view which basically has disregarded its existential soil out of which it's grown out of. Language can't exist in the Platonic sense. So this means that every language always occurs against the backdrop of a specific type of paradigm. Right? Um, so, for instance, the language games that I play in America would be different from the type of language games that might be used in England, for instance. Um, you know, a famous example of this is the thumbs up symbol. Um, you know, in the United States, it, thumbs up means a good thing. Yay, you did a good job. It's something to celebrate. Uh, it's something that's a positive and affirmative sign. But notice that, or you may not notice, but I believe in Australia, this actually is a vulgar symbol, right? So if you do a thumbs up, people will take it very negatively, right? And so notice here that the use of this corresponds to a specific backdrop, a certain set of conditions that people recognize and understand. Those conditions correspond to a form of life. And the thing here is that when we look at these platonic forms, these indestructible, um, transcendental ideas, these leap beyond the paradigm. They go beyond their use and beyond the form of life, and they seem to take us into what we might call a geography of nonsense, right? And this is ultimately, Wittgenstein was going to use this term nonsense throughout his work and throughout the philosophical investigations, but he uses it to say that nonsense 
is when the, the sense it was when our if our the sense of our words is derived from their use, but we start using words in a way that doesn't have a use. This is what nonsense is, <coughs> and this is what uh, Wittgenstein thinks that philosophers do. Philosophers start using words in nonsensical ways. I frequently joke with my students that philosophers love to make up words, and it's true. Philosophers are always making up words, um, but why are they making up words? This is Wittgenstein's point, is philosophers are making up words because they're ultimately engaged in this type of nonsense. And so ironically, when people accuse philosophers of talking nonsense, Wittgenstein agrees, but for very, I think, clear philosophical reasons. Now, another key idea that's going to get introduced here is the notion of family resemblances, and you'll see Wittgenstein discuss this. Instead of thinking of the essence of a term, the way Plato, right, or the medieval philosophers, or even Husserl is an interesting thing about the essence of something, Wittgenstein says there's no essence to the word justice. There's only family resemblances between the uses of justice. So instead of thinking of the essence of something, think of our concepts as having family resemblances. So when I use the word soul in church, or I use the word soul at a concert, those words have some sort of resemblance to each other, but they don't have the same as essence. They don't really mean the same thing. <clears throat> and what Wittgenstein thinks is, is that when we get trapped by our language, as we recognize is that there's resemblances between these different uses of language, and instead of recognizing that they're just resemblances, what we tend to leap to is some sort of essentialist, universalist project that wants to find the singular definition for all language or for all uses of the term justice. This is the entire project of Plato's Republic. And this, for Wittgenstein, is method methodically mistaken, right? The, that their family resemblance show us that there's changes in the way in which language, in the way in which our words work, and there's features that change over time, right? Consider the word game, for instance. Is there a common, is there a common essential definition to what all games are, right? No, there's not, right? There's a whole variety of the uses of the word game. He says... Don't say that there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see whether there is anything common to them all. For if you look at them, you will not see something that is common to them all, but you'll find similarities, relationships, and a whole series of them at that. And to repeat, don't think, but look. And this is a very important insistence for Wittgenstein, is that we have to describe our language rather than simply theorize about it. So Wittgenstein doesn't want to speculate, he wants to observe. Some people have often referred to Wittgenstein's method here as a sort of anthropological uh, methodology for language. I'm not sure I agree with that, but there's something more right about that than saying he does what Plato does, for instance. What we find is that language, <coughs> is that these words and their uses have similarities, and they, it's really a complicated network of similarities that are overlapping and crisscrossing all over each other, um, in that there is no singular unified system of language. Instead, we have language understood as an ancient city of differing paths. And this is the type of view of language that we see that Wittgenstein is beginning to articulate in the philosophical investigations. Well, that concludes my video for today, and for this first, for really the first 30 pages of the philosophical investigations, um, or if you will, the, uh, let's see there, the, uh, it's, you, it's sort of sections 1 through 75 of the Philosophical Investigations. This is sort of the central point that Wittgenstein is looking at. In our next video, we'll continue with the Philosophical Investigations, um, right starting at around section 75 and moving forward. And, and also what I'm hoping to do in these videos is really develop for you a nice systemic discussion of language seen from Wittgenstein's perspective. Again, it's always about showing, looking, rather than theorizing or speculating. So this has been Contemporary Philosophy. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys online. Okay, bye.